It's good to be in the house of God. If you have your Bibles, and turn with me to the book of uh, 2 Thessalonians, chapter number 2. And we're going to pick up this morning, I don't know which lesson this is in the series, but we're in, still in Christology. 2 Thessalonians, chapter number 2. And Christology is absolutely the most important subject in all the Bible. If you don't get the Lord Jesus right, the rest of it's meaningless. Father, I pray, Lord, for the wisdom to teach. And Heavenly Father, I pray that you give our folks ears to hear, Lord, and a heart that's receptive. And Lord, you said in, you'd guide us into all truth. And Father, for this age and this generation, for this moment now in time, we need to be guided into the truth. We need to see it and understand it as it unfolds before our very eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, now the context of 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 is this, verse 10. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Deception is not coming, deception's here. Quickly recap what, uh, what I've told you before about the uh, about Gnosticism and about the hierarchy as it relates to the uh, the idea that uh, that there is that there is a spiritual force at work uh, in the universe at the very top at the very top all the way at the top is the uh, one or the pleroma or the spirit or the all or the light or whatever you want to call it all kinds of different names that they use for this essence this being this consciousness, this cosmic consciousness that abides alone. From it issues forth emendations. An emendation is a uh, uh, manifestation like an aeon, like uh, waves that ripple through the water when you toss a pebble into it and you see the water ripple. It goes forth from this being, from this consciousness. Don't think of it as a personal God like we understand the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Think of it as some kind of a conscious intelligence or something up there. They, they have a hard time defining it themselves. But uh, the emanations that come forth from this being are eons, A-E-O-N-S. That's the highest order of a creature that comes forth from this supreme light, an aeon, eon, you might say. Uh, Lucifer is an eon. This is why they worship Lucifer. He's not the Lucifer of the Bible. To them, the word itself, Lucifer, means light bearer. So they worship Lucifer. Christ is sometimes included with him as an aeon. Sophia, the feminine principle of the aeon, is included in the group. She messed up one time, and from her came forth a demiurge. The Demiurge is the one who created the world, created this universe, created the physical structure that you know. He used, in the process of doing that, archons. An archon is an angel or a demon. In classic Greek mythology, a demon is not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes the demon is considered a good thing, sometimes bad, depending on who you're listening to. So the demons and the angels are accounted for. They're archons. They're, in, they're instrumental in the, in the uh, creation. And this demiurge is a petty, backwoods, ignorant God. He doesn't even know he's been created. He doesn't know he came forth from an eon, from Sophia. He thinks he is the ultimate reality. And so therefore he is a jealous, petty, uh, ignorant God. And he is the God of the Old Testament to the Gnostics. So now you know what he thinks about your Old Testament. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They make it very clear. That's what they believe. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he showed up 2,000 years ago, was a manifestation, an emanation of this being, this light, this all, this one, the pleroma, or the spirit, or whatever you want to call it. He's not what you think he is, according to them. 
He's an altogether different entity in reality. Now let's put all that together for just a moment before we get into what I'm going to be dealing with here in a moment. Uh, you say, does anybody really believe this preacher? People with IQs of 160 believe that. Some of the, uh, uh, probably most of the movers and shakers in the world who are, who are uh, creating public policy, who are determining what your kids learn in school, who control the finances of the world, who are instrumental in the rise and fall of governments. Keep your eye focused on the Ukraine and what's going on over there right now. They've overthrown the president. And they let a prime minister that had been locked up out of prison. She's out now. I don't know if she'll get support from the people, but look at the greater picture. Putin doesn't like it a bit because this president was headed back to Russia. And uh, so now you see some forces at play. I told you the other night, I think it was Wednesday night, you're watching the alignment of powers. Powers are being aligned. The Arab Spring is all just a ruse. There's something going on much deeper in the Arab Spring than simply uh, these nations uh, uh, rising up against dictators and what have you. But in any event, what you're having, what you have are people who believe this. They believe it in different manifestations. They don't all agree among themselves. But they listen to each other. They write their books. They listen to their spirit guides. And their spirit guides tell one one thing, another another thing. But there seems to be a uniformity with it because they're beginning to lead them in a certain direction. And the idea is what you do, you look for, you look for red flags that connect the dots. That's the way you do it. A lot of the stuff you can't make sense of. You can't make sense of everything that a New Ager believes. And the New Age movement, folks, is modern Gnosticism. That's all in the world it is. You say, well, then what has it got to do with the church? It's all over the church. And we'll talk about that later. It's shot through the church. The church is full of it. They use the terminology. They have the spirit. And they have the motivation. And uh, some of the churches today are new age to the core. And I'm going to read one just a moment. And it's, uh, <laughs> you're going to be surprised. But the idea is that there's a power, there's a power structure. And the power structure is built upon the fact that we have an overriding or an overruling power and that power is an intelligence and that intelligence is Satan. He's smart. He's been going about this for some time. 1947 in Roswell, New Mexico, a so-called alien craft crashed. How many ever heard of Roswell, New Mexico? If you travel out through there, that place is a hotbed of UFO theology and what have you from Roswell, New Mexico. Uh, as I've said to you before, UFOs exist, but what are they? That's the issue. It's not whether they exist or not. They exist, but what are they? It's just like demons. Do they exist? Absolutely. You don't walk backwards up a wall that defies all the laws of physics. There's no way you can do that. But if you have a supernatural power in play, then you can walk backwards up a wall. If Moses puts his serpent, uh, puts his rod down, turns to a serpent, and 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 and, and Janice and Jambres did the same thing, there's a power involved here that defies physics. If the if the God of this world can take the Lord Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple and show him the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, and tell him that I have this power, I can give it to you. Fall down, worship me. There's a power in play here. That's beyond human ability. So what you're witnessing, and this is a remarkable thing about it, and I hope I can stir your interest this morning. You're living in the very moments before the manifestation of this deceptiveness. It's coming. It's, it's here. And it's here on a grand scale. It's not just uh, localized here and there. It's everywhere now. But since 1947, the uh, appearance of UFOs have, uh, have, have exploded. Uh, North America and South America especially, they're all over the place. And we're not talking about uh, a few hundred here and a few hundred. We're talking about millions of people that uh, <coughs> apparently have seen them. And a lot of people have seen them and, and will not uh, say because they don't want to be considered a fool or, you know, a wacko. And by the way, if uh, I need, you need to know this. This is just something to interject because uh, of the way that of the social, the social society is moving in America. If there is any doubt in the government's mind that you don't have all your senses, they can come into your house and take every gun you've got, take everything and put you in a place of surveillance for your own protection, quote unquote. I thought I'd leave that with you. That's happening right now. 
And the reason, of course, is because the redefinition all the time, they're constantly redefining uh, mental illness and the treatment for it and what have you. And so this is the kind of thing that's going on right now. So since 1947, all of these appearances of UFOs have been uh, manifested all over the world, but especially in North America and South America. An unidentified flying object. So what's happening? What's all this, what's all it leading to? Well, I'm going to get into that in just a moment. But first of all, I want to read a, a, a paper that was sent to, mail to me, care of Temple Baptist Church. And it uh, says, Tennessee Interfaith Power and Light, Climate Prayer Vigil, Sunday, February the 16th from 4 to 5, Fountain City Park. Parking available at Fountain City Methodist Church across from the park. People of faith, that's a buzzword. <laughs> that's a meaningless term, but that's the buzzword. People of faith, you can have faith in the devils. What's that mean? People of faith are welcome to witness their concern for climate change and desire for effective climate protection policies. Our interfaith candlelight vigil will include reflection, singing, and aspiration. If not, if not now, when? Reflections will be led by so forth and so on. I'm sure a lot of these are good people as far as good moral people go. And I'm not saying anything this morning to cast any aspersion upon any of them. But here's the bottom line. They're getting together and having a prayer vigil over the climate. Now, now if, if that's all it was, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be a big deal. But that's not all it is. Agenda 21, which is a proposition uh, proposed by the United Nations, is designed to go in and take the sovereignty away from every nation on the face of this earth and turn over to the United Nations the control not only of the land, but of the populating of the land, of the building and so forth. That's Agenda 21. Now Agenda 21 has its roots in the Pleroma, the Demiurge, the Aeons, the Archons, all of this stuff. It is directly connected with Gnosticism and the New Age movement. Say, so how so, preacher? Because Agenda 21 is designed to protect Mother Earth. Sustainability. It's about Gaia. It's about Mother Earth, which according to these people, these Gnostics, all the things of Mother Earth are connected to the point it is a living entity. Now life not like your life, but it is a life nonetheless. And it's connected. It has a life of its own. And if we are enlightened evolutionists, if, we've, if we have evolved to this point in time where we ought to know better, then we should be concerned about our planet and seeing to its health. You say, I'm saying we I speak tongue in cheek. We is what they believe. I don't believe it, but that's what they believe. And so that's what this is about. Step further. It means that people are signing on to the United Nations and its spiritual agenda and its political agenda. And there is an agenda, believe me. I told you that in, after World War II, the Union was started in Los Angeles. It was started as a reaction against all the, the people, 50 million people, I think it was, is that the figure? World War II, 50 million plus died. And uh, Germany was lying in ruins, Poland in ruins, uh, much of Russia burnt to the ground, and all of this destruction worldwide, and they wanted to do something about it. So they created the United Nations. Now Woodrow Wilson had the precursor of it in the League of Nations back in the early 1900s. But the United Nations purpose was to unite the world, United Nations. How do we do this? We do it politically and we do it religiously. We want a one world government, we want a one world religion. They know that in order to have a one world government, they must have a one world religion. So we have to have an object to that religion. We have to common core, a common core that brings us together, that gives us a motivation, gives us a, a focal point. And so the earth and the sustainability of the earth is a good place to start. Yes. See what I mean? And so it's logical and, it's, and it makes sense that what we need to do is to, is to, uh, is to uh, is, uh, is, uh, uh, perpetuate planet earth to our next generation. And so all of this stuff about carbon, all of this stuff about the president that's in office now says the coal industry, I'll destroy the coal industry. He said that. 
And so now the senator up there in West Virginia, Manchin, who's a Democrat, and is in is in a, between the rock and the hard place. <laughs> Why? Because he represents coal digging people uh, that put him in office. He's a Democrat, and so now he can't support the Obama agenda. So what does he do? You see what it means? See how it works? And uh, and but the, re the but the president has an overriding motive behind this. He is an ideological person, folks. He's very ideological, not practical. Ideological. What does that mean? That means that he that means that he creates a policy, whether it works or not. He's going to create that policy because that's what he believes in. That's the idea, and that's where it's headed, and that's where it is, and that's where it's going to be. And we're facing what right now? We're facing. You're looking right now at the, at the development of this thing as it begins to develop right before your very eyes. We're not waiting for the deception to come. It's already here. It's descending. The churches should be a place of light, should be a place of the salt of the earth. You should be able to walk into a church house and you should be able to, to, dis, to, to, to disseminate the truth and tell people what's going on. They should learn from the church house where they are. And that's the last place you need to get today. You're going to learn anything. You're going to get a bunch of religious platitudes and cliches and love everybody and that's what you're going to get. And we're all in it together and every, as long as you're sincere about it and you're going to be okay and on we go. And so that's what's going on in the church house. Uh, let me show you the other spectrum, the other end of the spectrum. All right, we've got these people meeting for a prayer meeting and they're praying about climate change. They should be praying about salvation souls. They should be praying about the dissemination of the gospel. That's what we're here for. I'm not here uh, to, to battle climate change and carbon credits and, and, uh, and all of that stuff. That's incidental. My purpose in being in this earth is to preach the gospel. That's what I'm here for is to get the Word of God out. But on the other hand, let me show you how these things tie together. And I've showed you Guy, and we can get into a long thing. There's a lot of information on the Internet about the Green Agenda. The Green Agenda is Gaia. And it is the goddess reborn. The goddess, of course, is Sophia. And all of this stuff relates to the earth and it relates to Gnosticism and it relates to the New Age movement. We are in the age of Aquarius, according to them. We left the, the age of, uh, what is it, Pleiades or Pleiades or whatever that was. And we're in the age of Aquarius, the water bearer, the age of a new unfolding age of mankind, the time when mankind will be enlightened. It's now that we're going to learn. It's now that, that we're going to evolve, continue to evolve spiritually from the darkness that we came out of. And so being in this time, we need to, we need to be conscious of what's going on. Now here is a, uh, a new church that uh, uh, has just to come into being. And uh, the fellow's name who wrote this article, there's many of them. This man's name is Matt Wilstein, January the 16th, 2014. So it shows you how current this is. Yeezyanity, in quotes. How many's ever heard of Yeezyanity? See, I'd never heard of it. It just dropped in on me from the blue. <laughs> I was reading one thing and this came in. I think a lot of times the Lord does that for us. Yes. You know, here I am running this thing and first thing I know something just falls right in there on me. But anyway, Yeezyanity is either an actual new religion that considers rapper Kanye West. How many's ever heard of him? Yes. Yes. I know all the kids have, surely. I've heard his name. Okay. He's a rapper. Kanye West now watch this. It considers him to be its savior or a hilarious and elaborate art project that almost approaches the brilliance of West work. So this man gives it the possibility that this is all a ruse or it's a reality. I believe it's a reality because I got on their website this morning while I had a little bit of time before I came to church. I got on their website and I'll read some of the quotes from their website. They have a doctrine. They have a, a, a declaration of faith. And it's an elaborate website. So it, wouldn't th it seemed to me to be just a piece of art. Either way, the Church of Jesus. Now remember, Y-E-E-Z-U-S, not J-E-S-U-S. -E this is a play on words, though. He's playing on the name of Jesus, which is the name above every name. All right. Either way, the Church of Jesus has a very comprehensive website which presents the religion as an anonymous group who believes that the one who calls himself Jesus 
is a divine being who has been sent by God to usher in a new age of humanity. Now, digest that for a moment. Now, all this stuff we're talking about, the new age, definition of God, their definition, when they say God, they're not talking about the God you're talking about. Okay? It's called semantics. It's a, it's a play on, it's the way you understand, it's what you're doing with the word you're using. Okay? God. To me, when I say God, I'm talking about that almighty, eternal creator, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that eternal, infinite, invisible being who manifested himself as a man 2,000 years ago and walked on this earth and went to the cross and died for my sins to keep me out of hell. That's the one true and living God. That's God. I'm not God. You're not God. I'm sorry. You never will be. <laughs> you can't make it. We're creatures. But anyway, this divine being, now from the website, this is directly from their website, Our Savior. Big letters, they said, Our Savior. His real name is never to be spoken. He is known to us only as Jesus. Remember the Y, E-E-Z-U-S. He has shown the modern world the creative potential of a human being, and he serves as a living model for behavior and ethic. All right? The Church of Yeezyanity Declaration of Faith. Declaration number one, I believe I am a God. Declaration number two, I believe Jesus is a God. Number three, I believe in the creative power of man. Number four, I believe God wants man to create in his image. Now watch the wording. Did you catch that? The Bible said God made man in his image. God made man. But they say, I believe God wants man to create in his image. I believe God wants man to fully express himself. I believe money has become unnecessary. Well, tell the guy at the store down here when you want to buy you a loaf of bread. I believe man has the power to create everything he wants and needs. There's that divine spark in you. There's that pleroma inside you. Remember, when the man was made, when the man is made on this earth, he has in himself a divine spark that connects him and he goes around the Old Testament God and makes a direct connection with that God up there in the universe. And that divine spark simply needs to be unfolded, nurtured. And the way to do that is by your connection with spirit guides and spirit beings. This is what these people are teaching. He said, I believe Jesus will lead us into a new age of creativity. I believe I will help usher in the new age of creativity. Faith be in Jesus. Faith be in God. Amen. Do you notice one word that's not in there? Sin. You know why it's not in there? The Gnostics don't deal with sin. Sin's not an issue with them. It's all about human potential. It's all about human creativity. It's all about that light within us that we will be able to contact that light above us. And that Christianity, quote unquote, Christ and the God of the Old Testament, has held men back for so long that they need to be freed from the fetters of organized religion. That's their message. Yes, sir. Uh, if you break it down and look at what Benny Hinn and those, that crowd believes, you can sure. It's basically, the same thing that you're talking about. You sure can. You, but what they do is just change the wording. But the philosophy is still there. It's all there. Now, what is a UFO? Unidentified flying object. Vast majority of the cases of unidentified flying objects are simply things out there that are physical things that somebody just didn't uh, recognize or understand. We understand that. Vast majority of them. So there's no big deal. But there is enough going on that absolutely does not fit into the mold. Now, last week I couldn't remember the man's name, but I've got it for you this morning. He was at the head of the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard. His name is John Mack. Let me see if I can find this information right here. His name is John Mack. He approached this thing from a strictly secular point of view. That's important. 
he approached it from a strictly secular point of view. John Mack. Dr. John Mack is a Pulitzer Prize winning author who up until his death served as the head of psychiatry department at Harvard University School of Medicine. All right, now just digest that for a moment. He's not some loon down here on Hayboy Corner, you know, uh, fired up on dope, hallucinating. This man, okay, he's got all the credentials that anybody wants in this world to believe what he says. So what does he do? He goes into this extensive research into UFO contactees, people who have had contact with UFOs. Now you've got UFOs falling first, second, third, fourth, fifth kind. We'll get into all that this morning. But one of the kinds of Uf UFO is fourth kind, I believe it is, is where you have contact. You come in contact with a spiritual entity. And once the person has had contact with a spiritual entity, it has a profound effect on their life for the rest of their life. Uh, I found a site on, on the internet that is dedicated to helping people who have had this contact in their life get free of it. What do you mean free? Once they've had contact with UFO, uh, with an UFO being, they have nightmares, they have visitations of ghosts, they have demonic experiences, they have clairvoyance, clairaudience, they have levitation, they have all this demonic manifestation that takes place in their lives and it drives them insane. So contacting UFOs far, far more than simply looking up into the skies and seeing something or something con comes to you and, uh, you know, it's, once it's over, it's over, go on hunky-dory and live the rest of my life. No, it doesn't work that way. And I will tell you why. You have come in contact with a spirit being. That's what's happened. And there's two spirits in this world, three. There's the spirit of an unsaved man, dead. There's the spirit of this world, the God that worketh in the children of disobedience. That's Satan. And then there's the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is only in those that are born again. He affects those that aren't, but he only dwells in a believer. You've got to be born again to have the Holy Spirit dwell within you. And the fact that he is in you is proof positive you are born again. That is the seal of your inheritance. That's proof that God has set you aside, saved you, and you know where you're going when you leave this world. Now, and also the fact that if you truly have the Holy Spirit, he'll guide you into truth. He, will, he, becomes, a, uh, he becomes a mentor to you, a red flag for you when you come in contact with this stuff. Now, the thing about these UFOs is they got a message. They got a message. Now, I remember how I was fascinated with the idea of UFOs. I was fascinated with life on other uh, extraterrestrial life, E.T., I was fascinated with the knowledge, the idea that, that, that something dwelt way out there. That was the way I felt long before I got saved. Uh, I was fascinated with Star Trek. Years ago when Star Trek first came out, and I was around when it came out, see, I've been, I, I was around when everything came out, <laughs> and then when it left. <laughs> so I was there. <laughs> when, when Spock, I'll never forget everybody, they talked about Spock. He's got these pointed ears, and he's a, what is a Vulcan? And a, a, a human parent, one mother, a father, human, and I think his mother was a human, and his father was a was a a, a what? A Vulcan. And and Spock was very intelligent, you know. He was a walking computer and all this. Oh, it fascinated people, folks. You can't. It's hard for you to believe today at how big a deal Star Trek was when it first came out. And it, it is true. And, uh, and, and we watched that thing uh, re religiously. And Gene Roddenberry, I think, was the author of it. And when he passed away, they cremated him, put his ashes in a urine, and took him up and shot him off into space at his request. That's what he wanted, to send off into space. Uh, but so anyway, that was, that, was, uh, that was Star Trek. That was the fascination with the unknown, the fascination with this other world. The fascination with, with the unknown is basically it. Man has always been fascinated by the unknown. This is why the explorer, Jacques Cousteau, when he sailed the oceans, he wanted to see what's below the sea. The fascination with the unknown, and which leads to uh, curiosity, which leads to trouble because people delve into witchcraft, Ouija boards, tarot cards, all this stuff. They get into it because they just like to play with it. They think they're in control because it's, you know, it's the unknown. And they don't realize that once they start it, it controls them. 
because there's a reality to it. So, so uh, aliens, alien craft, uh, UFOs and all of that, uh, it, 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 mar I marvel at the fact that these contactees, they, when they come down and begin to contact a human being, they got a message. That'll blow your mind. It doesn't make sense that something that is billions of light years off out here into, into the Never Never world come, visits planet Earth and it's got a message. Let's listen to the message. This is amazing. This will blow your mind. Dr. Leo Sprinkle, PhD, Professor Emeritus at Wyoming University summarized the experience by saying that UFO contactees have been chosen no UFO contact is accidental. Now, I'm talking about contact. Please understand, not a visual where you see one. I'm talking about where you have a contact with a spirit being, the little gray man, usually the grays they call them. About this tall, big head, big eyes, slanted eyes. You've all seen them. And uh, UFO contact have been chosen. No UFO contact is accidental. The manifestations are designed to influence the worldview of contactees. What follows is a summary of these claims about UFO experiences and related conditions. UFO contactees have been chosen. No UFO contact is accidental. Number two, contactees are ordinary people who exhibit a caring or loving concern for all humankind. UFO experiences include paraphysical, parapsychological, and spiritual manifestations which are designed to influence the world view of humankind. They want mankind to think a certain way. Contactees are programmed for a variety of future activities including awareness of their own contacts, desire to share their messages, and knowledge with other contactees. The lives of contactees move in the direction of greater self-awareness, greater concern for the welfare of planet Earth, Gaia, meeting over here, prayer meeting, and a greater sense of cosmic citizenship. Cosmic bubble, cosmic consciousness, a greater aware sense of cosmic citizenship with other beings in the universe. The personal metamorphosis of UFO contactees is the forerunner of a social transformation in human consciousness, which now is leading to changes in the economic, educational, military, political, and religious institutions of nations on the earth. The new age of true science and spirituality. This is from uh, R. Leo Sprinkle, quoted in the Encyclopedia of Extraterrestrial Encounters, Pages 136 through 140, Ronald D. E. Story, editor. The Book of Revelation, expert secular PhD opinion, is that aliens are prepping people to accept the merging of politics, religion, and money into a new age system. Did you get that? There's a message. There's a message. You don't get that on the History Channel. Let me read what the History Channel had to say about UFOs. This is very interesting. Here's the History Channel. History Channel's got some good stuff. And they got some junk. <laughs> it's kind of like a cafeteria. You got to know what's good and what's junk. <laughs> Listen to this. History Channel, 2002. The Bi this is, the, this is the, the runner up to the series. The Bible, a sacred text filled with fantastic tales of an awesome supernatural force. But what if that force wasn't God? What if it was a UFO? In Ezekiel, what was that gleaming wheel within a wheel that descended on the prophet? In the Sodom and Gomorrah of Genesis, where did the devastating fire and brimstone come from? In Exodus, what was that presence in the sky that led Moses through the desert? Were these the actions of God, or might these mysterious forces in the sky have been UFOs in the Bible? Throughout the Bible, mysterious aerial phenomena appear and alter the course of human history. To religious scholars, these stories are an infallible record of God's presence and godly events. But some modern-day researchers offer a different theory. Perhaps these stories really describe alien visitations. Barry Downing, 
and this is a quotation from Barry Downing, is it possible that extraterrestrials have been involved in human history for thousands of years? And if so, did they have contact with the biblical people? And as you look in the Bible, there are many reports of UFOs that contact biblical people, a chariot of fire that abducts Elijah and takes him off into the sky. The narrator, Elijah was one of the most revered Jewish prophets of his day. According to UFOologists, the biblical account of his encounter with chariots of fire is a detailed description of what might be termed a UFO. The History Channel, UFOs in the Bible. Now what are they saying? A lot of people watch the History Channel. What's the spin? What's the message? And then of course they interview Mr. Downing. He's got a clerical collar on and represents religious, gives the religious view and what have you and so forth and so on. It gets deep. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. I've been to his tomb at Mount Vernon, and right there across the wall it says, uh, he's quoting the scripture. This is a big scripture reference uh, at the tomb of George Washington. Now, somebody will come along if they've done any reading all this. Oh, now he was a 33rd degree Mason in reference to George Washington, and you see pictures of him with his, with his, uh, his uh, 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 apron and, you know, and all the paraphernalia that go with it and all that. But the Masonic Lodge is an evolving thing. That's the thing you got to get about the Masons. They evolve. And Albert Pike in his Morals and Dogma, uh, when he wrote that in the 1800s, pretty well began to spell out the theology of the Masonic Lodge. And the theology in the, in, in the Morals and Dogma is occultist, New Age, long before it was ever called the New Age, Gnosticism, bare bones. I mean, he laid it out. It's there for anybody to see it. Yes, sir. It's under Homeland Security now, her driver's license? Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. They wanted to go for a face recognition picture. Yeah. See? Right. Well, here's the way that face recognition works. I know it. It's, it's, it's federal now. Yeah. All right. You know what Google Glass is? Yeah. Okay. How many of y'all know what Google Glass is? Okay. Some of you don't. Yeah. All right. Now, this is, we're talking about technologies, leaping forward technology. Google Glass is where you put a pair of glasses on, and right up here in the corner, you can be connected to an internet, and you can be connected to high technology. Yeah. You, can be, uh, you can be interacting with this technology while you're trying to walk along. So it's not enough to be given at this while you're trying to drive, or this, I know, you know. Now you've got this, but here's the sinister part about it. The technology has come to the point now to where they've scanned her face and if you've got a pair of these glasses on and you have contact with the database, they know your name, they know where you live, they know all about you when they see you walking down the street toward them. You've immediately lost every bit of your privacy. That's right. Now you say that's Big Brother on steroids. You better believe it. When you're walking down the street, if they've got the glass on, they know who you are. Isn't it a shame that they could be anybody? That's right. Yes, sir. In the late at night, I have a Galaxy Note tablet and I got a brand new uh, Samsung computer. Uh -huh. Whether they're off or on, the tablet takes information off the big computer and puts it on the big I hear the <laughs> And I said, what, I said, Donna, what's going on? What's, what's that noise I hear all the time? I don't like those beeps, brother. I don't yeah. like them. I 
see and from things that I was looking on the on the big computer, I turned on my tablet and they were on the, my, my, my they were on my tablet. That's what the cloud was about. <laughs> and, but automatically they do that. You know. Sure they do. Now they don't tell you about it when they do it. I never have gotten a letter from any of them saying, "Is it okay for us to invade your privacy and do yeah. this over here?" You know, and we're going to do this. Somebody's running these things and it's drawn, you know, through Google. Google's bigger for the government, and I don't. I, Microsoft is on the big computer, but when they're modern, all the modern. Yeah, the operating systems. I mean, you've got Microsoft, and you've also got that uh, uh, the this, the one that, what's it called, Android, yeah, and these other operating systems. Yeah, is, yeah. They're using that tablet to pick up everything. Yeah, does. yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, the way that uh, face recognition works is just like your fingerprint. There are certain points on your fingerprint on the, on the, the way your design of your print. They do a seven to ten point configuration on your face. Once that's entered into computers in a database, and then every time you go past a street light where a camera is located, they yeah. can scan that yeah. and automatically pick up and identify who you are by that technology. And so when Snowden came out with all that stuff about the NSA, he says that he's got, I don't know how much more he's got, he's got all kinds of stuff piled up over there that he hasn't even brought out yet. Yeah, you can't, even, and, you can't go nowhere where they don't know where you're at. And uh, you wonder about a lot of that stuff that he's, that he's trying to get out there. Yeah, yeah. And how much? you walk through a Walmart or any type of department store where you have these scanners on the side of the door, yeah. if you have a credit card in your pocket or anything like that, they identify you as going through that yeah. area. I mean, there's, it's crazy. So oh, okay. yeah, well, here's the thing. I mean, you know, if it had just been sprung on us overnight, we'd all panic. But the thing is, we've been prepared for it. This is it's like, a, like the frog in the pot. It's been a slow, gradual process. And people have been brainwashed and conditioned, and, and, and now they just accept it. They're taking the states away in all government. And a lot of these, uh, you talk about the UFOs, a lot of these new ex these experts have really been involved in this. Now they're starting to believe that they're not actually aliens, that they're demonic creatures that, that, that are always been here and that they live in the earth. And well, where does it say that hell is located? Exactly. And when they dug that hole over there in Siberia and stuck that microphone down in there, you talk about uh, controversy. They've tried every way in the world to discredit that, but they can't do it when they heard the screams down there in that hole mm -hmm. in Siberia. And what they found it's, in the Antarctic and stuff and, uh, is kind of puzzling. Yes, and Admiral Byrd, I told you what, you know, what he said, a highly decorated uh, military man, you know, uh, in the World War II at Operation High Jump when they went down there to, to the South America. Uh, all that. So what am I, what am I going to do, preacher? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. That's what you do. He said it would be deception, didn't he? You know, everybody thought, well, I've got it all figured out. Well, 50 years ago, nobody had figured out. <laughs> this is all different. It's, it's completely different from what people expected. But it's real, folks. It's real. And uh, I've got a whole lot more material that I just, uh, you know, didn't even get to this morning. But I laid enough foundation for you to understand there is a message involved with these creatures. And, and what are they? I'll just say pl plainly and simply right here now before I, before I shut up this morning. It's demonic. It's a spirit world. And it is not the Holy Spirit. It's an alien. You better believe it's alien. It's alien to Christ and alien to the gospel. And does it affect me? Yes, it affects you. Yes, it does affect you because uh, you better watch the direction of the federal government. You better watch the direction of the federal government, see which way it's headed. And uh, uh, there's been a lot of rumor about the fact that Obamacare has in part of it a, an installation of a chip in people. Yeah. I haven't done enough digging on that to find out how much truth's in it, but yeah. it doesn't surprise me a bit, you know, that, that they're going to eventually Obamacare is going to reveal the fact that you need a chip. And I'll call Nancy Pelosi up and say, hey, Nancy, you didn't know that was in there either, did you? When you say, let's go ahead and vote on it, and then we'll find out what's in it. Well, here's what was in it. <laughs> and see what she thinks about that as it keeps coming out. Yes, sir. There was an engineer back in the 80s or late or early 90s that came out of Area 51, supposedly. Area 51. And he claimed that, uh, that and he was in a panic that these creatures were not what we think they are. 
but they're interdimensional creatures, which would make them spiritual type of creatures. Yeah. They have no way of going in interdimensional yet. Well, the thing, here's the biggest problem, and I'll shut up because we've run out of time. Everybody has the idea because it's demonic, it has to be wild, crazy, foaming at the mouth, you know, all that kind of stuff. No, folks, it could be the sweetest, smoothest, slickest stuff you ever saw in your life and still be purely demonic. Absolutely. It doesn't have to be crazy and wild to be demonic. The Lord sent in evil spirits to Saul. Yeah, he did. And that spirit said, I will go and be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. Intelligent beings. Yeah. All right, we'll have word prayer and we'll let you go. Brother Barry, will you dismiss us, please?